My name is Maria Nomowska and here we are at the Town Hall in Auckland, New Zealand to have a closer look at Mozart's clarinet concerto in A. Behind me is the APO, the Auckland Philharmonia Orchestra, who are brilliant and they're going to help us examine the different features of the first movement of the work. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart was born on the 27th of January 1756. He was born into a musical family. His father played music and his sister as well. And there are some accounts that explain how he used to push in into her musical lessons and wanting to have a go on the piano. His father decided to take him under his wing, so to speak, and teach him a few skills. At age seven, the family set off on a three-year tour to Germany and Mozart was exposed to many of the various kinds of court musicians along the way. Court musicians that sometimes were trained in Italy, which was the center of the uh, musical development during the Baroque period, the one just before. Mozart was born right at the cusp of the classical period, so many obvious influences come from the period before. He loved um, coming across the Mannheim Orchestra in a little German village called Mannheim because there was 48 of them as opposed to the 30 which were typical of the Baroque period. And also at the helm was Johann Stamitz, who was a violinist himself. At age 17, Mozart met Haydn in Vienna. And although he stuck around for a little bit, it wasn't yet the permanent move he needed to make. But at age 25, he did take the plunge and move to Vienna, where he collaborated with Haydn and played in chamber music settings together. The classical period is generally to believed to have lasted from 1750 to 1820, 1825, depending on which book you read. Changes in music started happening a lot earlier with Bach's sons. They started looking at simplifying the music, which was polyphonic and contrapuntal and quite complex in many ways to follow. Um, this was reflected in architecture and clothing at the time too. The orchestra did grow due to the Mannheim Orchestra's popularity, where um, instrument numbers rocketed to 48 plus the timpani. Uh, the string section kept on being quite big during this period, um, because the string family finished being perfected during this time. The movers and shakers of the spheres, such as Mozart, um, Haydn and Beethoven, knew of each other and listened to each other's music. Haydn, for example, um, looked at some of Bach's son's works and tried to imitate them in his earlier schooling. Mozart, around age seven, came across um, Bach's prelude and fugues and tried to imitate his style and write. Um, for a small group of instrumental players that he met with at a Duke's house on a Saturday morning. As time went on, um, Haydn being the eldest out of the three had a huge influence on Mozart and Mozart was very much inspired by his string quartets. He then created string quartets that he dedicated to Haydn, which were a fusion of what Bach presented, but also what Haydn brought to the scene. Towards the end of his life, Mozart was running out of money and he also had a new son. During this time, he decided to take another tour of Germany and through his letters, we can find evidence to say that his journey was mostly pleasant. His letters have been published and he has a very quirky sense of humor. During this time, he composed a lot of works, mostly operatic, and they were very fast in production. The concerto was an orchestral work in three movements, fast movement, slower movement, and then faster one to end. The main melody of the clarinet concerto in A is a perfect example of what classic simplicity and beauty should look like. We have a four bar with a four bar structure, almost like a sentence with a comma in the middle. This melody is stated twice to begin with, with the orchestra and the clarinet, but then the clarinet takes it in its own soloistic moment and makes an incredible job of displaying its virtuosic ability. We're now going to hear the main melody played by the orchestra and the soloist Paul Dean.
originella form is a little bit like a musical Big Mac. We have the one theme that is played by the orchestra and keeps on returning in between episodes for the soloist or soloists. The ritornello sections are louder, whereas the soloist sections are a little bit quieter and they have a very contrasting role within the ritornello form. And here is the ritornello form played by the orchestra. One could look at this as Mozart taking what was popular in the Baroque period with what was very popular during the classical period, the sonata form. We have the sonata form's exposition development and recapitulation under which the Ritonello fits in perfectly. The cadenza was the moment where the soloist got to shine. Not to say that there aren't plenty of moments that the clarinet shines in this piece, but the cadenza was the one free rein usually given to the soloist. This piece, however, keeps the soloist on a tight rein. Or maybe it doesn't. Maybe it's just about the virtuosity on display throughout the entire piece. The technical control the soloist needs to have in order to be able to execute the music Mozart has written beautifully is quite virtuosic on its own without the need of a cadenza. In the first movement, there are two cadenza moments indicated in the score with a long pause. Uh, Mozart wrote out the embellishment the clarinet soloist should be playing, but typically that is when the cadenza would happen. In a sonata form, the first theme and the second theme are connected with the transitioning section. There is a reason for that. The first theme is usually in the tonic and the second in the dominant key. They're also meant to contrast each other and Mozart does make them contrasting. However, in this case, he does not reveal the second subject until the clarinet solo begins in bar 100. And it does fit within the norm. It is in the dominant key of E major.
the transition sections typically fill up the space between major elements within a piece of music. We are talking about moments such as going from theme one to theme two, and here is usually where the modulation happens. Little symptoms of accidental start appearing to solidify the new key we've gone to. In the Italian language, as soon as you add a little eta, it becomes automatically smaller. We have a large ending, a coda, found at the end of a piece, and we have a codita, a smaller section found at the end of the exposition. This case, however, Mozart breaks the rules because rules are made to be broken. We have two coditas, but no coda. Sonata format, the development section deals with many compositional devices in developing the thematic material introduced in the exposition. The composer can have a free range in tonality and moves quite frequently through different keys. Often these will be the subdominant, dominant relative minor, or in this case, in harmonic minor, just to spice it up a little bit. The recapitulation is the restatement of the opening section, but copying and pasting it would be just lazy and boring for the listener. So instead, the recapitulation typically keeps both the theme one and theme two in the tonic key throughout to solidify the key of the movement.
An easy way to deal with the lingo is to think of a recapitulation as a recap of the opening section. I'm here with Graham Abbott, the conductor of today's session, and I wanted to ask you a few questions about how the role of conducting has changed. Um, Jean-Baptiste Lully in the Baroque period um, suffered a, a very bad accident that unfortunately claimed his life, but he began a notion of keeping time for the orchestra by bashing a pole into the floor. How has that changed over time? Well, I'm very glad we don't have to bash a pole into the floor anymore. But it's interesting if you hear some recordings of Lully and 17th century French music, to be authentic, some conductors actually add someone in pounding something on the floor. But unfortunately, Lully hit his foot and spent three months dying of gangrene poisoning. It was terrible. Um, the role of the conductor then developed, so by the time the Mannheim Orchestra was uh, in operation, an orchestra that Mozart saw and admired, uh, there were people like Stamitz who would lead from the violin, waving the bow. And uh, it was through that that uh, either as a violinist or as a keyboard player, the conductor would also be a member of the orchestra. Mm. And it really wasn't until around just after Mozart's time that the conductor, as we know it, standing out the front with a stick, developed. So it's been a long, slow process, but we've really only had conductors in the way that we think of them since about 1800. Absolutely. And so lots of people ask, if you have a group of brilliant musicians already, why do you need a conductor? Well, it's interesting because when you think about it, music like this, didn't have a conductor, Mozart would have directed this piece probably from the keyboard, either a harpsichord or a forte piano, uh, in conjunction with the principal violinist. It was a, a joint leadership. Um, but these days, modern players are used to having a conductor out the front, although many work like a chamber orchestra without a conductor. Mm -hmm. It depends on what they're used to. And as music developed in complexity and in sheer size through the 19th century, you really needed to have someone out the front holding it all together. And it's probably not the thing to say, but it's really true that sometimes we're just like a bit of a traffic cop, that we just have to keep the traffic going and keeping it all together. Obviously in rehearsal we do a lot more than that. We stop and start and we ask for things to be played in a certain way. because. Um, the conductor has a vision of the piece, but also we have to fit our vision in with the vision of the players and where the players are at. So I could conduct the same piece with different orchestras and have a different result because the chemistry is different. It's one of the things I love about my job. I have a view, but it's not the view. Mm. And it's always a collaborative effort. Yes, absolutely, an organic process. It is, very much so, very much so. And if you have too much rehearsal time, that can also be a problem because you think you lose the spontaneity. Uh, and if you have not enough, there's a bit of adrenaline that gets you going. So it's never ideal and it's never perfect, but it's exciting because every uh, time you perform a piece, even if it's the same piece, it's different. You've conducted this piece quite a few times. It hasn't become boring for you from what I can tell. Absolutely not. But you must have favourite pieces in it, favourite moments that still make your adrenaline rush. Yeah, there are, Mozart is very special, I think, uh, because the 18th century is music that I tend to specialise in, also areas of the 20th century, although my repertoire is very broad these days, conductors have to conduct everything and be mm, a sort of specialist in everything, but my personal favourite period is the 18th century, and that includes the late Baroque and the classical period. And Mozart is very special because there's something about uh, the richness of, of his melodic ideas, and this piece is a perfect example of it. There's melody after melody after melody that he just pours out and then develops in a way that never sounds excessive and always sounds perfectly balanced. 
For me, the most touching moment is the central slow movement, which is, it's so simple on paper, yet the harmonies and the balance of the phrases and the, the, the way that he voices the string parts and the way that, for example, in the A section, the, the melody when it's stated by the clarinet is only accompanied by the strings, but the double basses don't play. Yes, yes. So there's a lighter string texture. The double basses join in later when the full orchestra plays. So Mozart is absolutely aware of how to get the best effect, effect absolutely. And, and colours. And apart from the, the, just the sheer aching beauty of the melody, which is so simple when you look at it, but it, there's something magical about it that I can't put my finger on, and I'm glad I can't, because I love that mystery. Thank you very much for joining us today. You're very welcome. Imitation is a compositional device, one of many that Mozart was very good at using to develop his pieces. Bach had a big influence on Mozart um, throughout his life, and Bach was very big in fugal writing. The chordal accompaniment came into the forefront with the homophonic texture that was the popular texture during this period, replacing the complexities of counterpoint and polyphony. may be known in jazz but it did exist during the baroque period and classical and even probably further back than that it is in evidence several times throughout the music and it keeps the listeners on its toes like using a sequence to develop a section into a slightly longer section and keep it going if you're running out of ideas. I'm sure that wasn't the case for Mozart. He had many ideas, in fact. This is why this is one of the longer movements of the three.
much genius credit is given to a guy named Albert, who decided to break up a chord, alternating from low to high to mid to high. Many musicians start off with learning this kind of a device when they begin learning an instrument. It is not the easiest passage to play for the clarinet solo. Out of the three main textures of monophonic music, homophonic and polyphonic music, homophonic was the main one that the classical period explored with. That's not to say there are no polyphonic sections in this piece, but it is certainly the predominant one. Homophonic texture just means that you have two independent parts. Classical instruments weren't quite exactly what we know them as today. The French horns, for example, were natural horns and didn't have the capability to play all the notes they can today. They were limited to the harmonic range. The clarinet at this time was still very much undergoing change. Anton Stadler was in fact one person that could probably pull this off at in that area during this time. Mozart knew Stadler and they collaborated on quite a few performances. And Stadler liked exploring with his clarinet, so much so that he created a newer version of it that could go four semitones lower than usual. That new version was known as the Basset clarinet. And this is the original instrument this work was written for. But before you think it's that simple, 199 bars of this work were written for the Basset horn in 1787. And then Mozart recycled the material and rewrote it for the Basset clarinet. Stadler was very good at what he did. He modified his instruments and then became a master at playing them. This piece is one of the harder virtuosic pieces written for woodwind solo instrument. The original instrument this piece was written for was the Basset clarinet. It could reach four semitones lower than what the modern clarinet can. The lower range of the clarinet is known as the Chalamot range. It's a very big contrast to the higher range of the clarinet. This piece is a very good example of what the clarinet can reach. It has very high passages and very, very low passages, at many points jumping two and a half octaves. <laughs> Thank you. 
mentioned earlier that this work originally started in its concept as a work for the Basset horn and then Mozart rewrote it for the Basset clarinet, which Stadler could play. As time has gone on, however, this instrument has fallen out of favour and is no longer in circulation. However, you can check out the links below for a demonstration of this instrument. It even talks about a sketch that Stadler used in one of the programmes of the performance of this piece. I'm here with Paul Dean, our fabulous soloist for today. Um, Paul has just played this piece for the 51st time. My 50th, 51. 50th, give or take. Yeah. I wanted to find out what happens before you start a concert. Do the nerves still kick in? Yeah, uh, very much so. It doesn't matter to me how many times I've played this piece. It will always be a great challenge and it's you have to climb the mountain every time. Um, the challenges never get easier. In fact, I've noticed in the last few years, as I've gone into my middle age, that it actually has become a little harder uh, energy-wise. And um, so I guess I get nervous enough, um, but it's a different sort of nerves to playing the Mozart Quintet with friends and going out on stage, the music's there, and it's a lot more collegial. This is a little bit more Spotlight. Uh, yeah, yeah, the spotlight's on you and um, it's one of the few pieces I, I do from memory so it's always a case of is, is the memory secure? Uh, there's lots of repetition in the Mozart so mm. you've got to always be completely aware of which particular section that you're doing and I guess that's one of the great challenges of, of recording this morning with the little bits and pieces that we did. Um, reminding myself that I was in the recapitulation, not the exposition, and it goes this way, it doesn't go that way. So It yeah. also plays in the way you play it and articulate it. Absolutely, and, and it's a lot to do with the characters of, of it as well. Tell me about the characters that you mentioned. How do you see the piece as far as characters go? I see it like I see all Mozart. It's, Mozart was a, a primarily, in my opinion, an operatic composer, so I see this as, a, uh, as an opera for clarinet and orchestra. And because it was written at the same time as Magic Flute, mm -hmm. I see the characters Pamina, Sarastro, Monostatos and uh, Papageno throughout the entire piece. Um, and it can be within half a bar, it can change characters uh, very, very quickly and there's lots of conversations and some of the bits that we, we recorded again this morning were, were uh, very simply and very easily understood as a conversation between Pamina and Sarastro or Pamina and Papageno. Um, and I see the second movement really as, as almost the greatest aria he ever wrote, very much like Archic Fools from Magic Flute, mm -hmm. which is Pamina's greatest aria and my favourite aria from all opera. Um, I see that very much as, as, as the most perfect aria that's ever been written for the clarinet. In your experience of playing this fabulous instrument, technically this piece would score out of 10? Oh, I guess it uh, depends what sort of things you're looking at when you talk about in terms of virtuosity. I mean, there's, there's more uh, finger technique uh, challenging pieces. I guess even the second concerto of Weber written, you know, some a few decades after this is much more technically challenging for the fingers. The Nielsen Concerto from the early half of the 20th century is enormously um, challenging technically and of course the Francais Concerto is amongst the hardest things ever written. However, this is uh, difficult because it's of its precision and, and the, the actual way he uses the, uh, the instrument through the registers is is, is, is challenging from that perspective and you really need an absolutely perfect read to be able to do all the things that he obviously wanted you to do. Having said that, of course, I'd love to have heard the first performance. I'm sure Stadler was an absolute genius, but his clarinet had five keys and he had to half hole or add extra fingers down low to play semitones and, and look, it must have been an absolute nightmare for him. Um, I would love to have heard that. Um, so there, there would have been a certain degree of, um, I guess, for want of a better word, roughness in, mm. in those first hundred years of performances before the clarinet started to look something like this. Yes. And I guess it's thanks to composers like Weber and Spohr 
a few decades after that that the, the players just started demanding that they had more keys to play sharps, flats, etc. You have favourite parts of the work? Um, yeah, I, it, that's, a, that's a difficult question. I mean, I absolutely love the second subject of the first movement. I think it's, you know, it's one of the great joys to play. Um, I always call Pamina's aria. Ba -da -dee -da -da -dee -da -da. I love that bit. I, th I think it's absolutely divine. And then he brings it back in a different key in the, in the recap. I love playing that. I love playing the, the, the second movement just because of the challenge of, of trying to make the legato as liquid as you possibly can. And then playing, you know, really um, softly on the, on the, re the return of the A section. But funnily enough, you know, it's the last movement which is mostly Pap Papageno, I think it's absolutely hilarious. And I don't think it's the sort of movement that you can really take that seriously. It's, it's a lot of fun. And once you've got hold of the technical um, challenges of the last movement, it, it really should just be a riot. Fantastic. Tell me about the technical changes you need to go through in order to jump from the Shamala range to the two and a half of high range of the instrument? Um, well, technically, and my students would hate it if I said anything else, or well, they'd give me hell about it, I'm sure. There shouldn't be any change in your embouchure at all. Um, there should be, you know, you need to voice the notes very much with your throat opening, you know, to various levels. Um, changing the registers on the clarinet, particularly in the range that Mozart is wanting you. I mean, obviously composers, of the recent times have gone about another fifth higher than, than Mozart expects you to go. Um, that, that does cause some challenges when you've got to go up to top C's, D's mm. and etc. cetera. Um, but really the, the embouchure needs to stay the same. Uh, the fingerings obviously change, the, the, the register keys, all those sorts of things change. But technically you should be able to keep your embouchure exactly the same. You're just voicing it differently either with your air or your, 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 your throat or the way you open your mouth, the way you use your soft palate, all those sorts of things. So that's a great thing to learn and, and actually learning the slow movement is one of the great challenges for a, for a young student to contend with those things because they think they have to change it and actually the thing you have to convince them is that you don't. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your expertise and time today. My it pleasure. It was fantastic to see you in action and to see you dance as well. You seem to... Oh yeah, I'm sorry about it. that. I'm no, just... never <laughs> apologise. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. And now we're going to hear the entire piece played by the Auckland Philharmonia Orchestra with conductor Graham Abbott and soloist Paul Dean. Thank you.